So I haven't had a chance to formally welcome you all back, so it's good to have uh, almost, almost everyone back. Uh, it's good to have a full house again. Um, the volume levels have indeed risen, and uh, it's great. It's great to have you here. So we're heading into the last semester. Yesterday, uh, during our, our Mass, we meditated the, the idea of, of not living with regrets, right? So not doing things kind of half-heartedly or living with a lot of what-ifs and what we could have and what we should have done and what we didn't. And we took the example of Domenico, Dominic Savio, uh, when he was asked by Don Bosco, if you had an hour left to live, what would you do? And he said, well, I'd finish this game of football. The idea being that, like, there's nothing that I could have or would have should have done that I haven't done. So I would stay doing exactly what I'm doing now. Because if there was something I should have done, I'd have done it. You know, it's just a, it's a, it's, the saints are ready to go whenever the Lord calls them because they haven't left things undone. So it's, 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 a, it's a wonderful way of living where, Lord, if you call me now, I'd say, grand, yeah, I guess I'll finish dinner and uh, do the wash up and call me away, sure. Like, do you know, I, oh, I should have called my mother, I should have done this, I should have been a better friend, mother, brother, sister, priest, whatever it was. Like, we're, that's the kind of thing we should be doing already. So, as we head into this, this final semester, uh, this is a really, really important time because it, it, it's the culmination of a whole lot of preparation. Uh, last year's group, as some of our second years will remember, last year's group were deprived of a final semester because the year got cut off uh, two weeks ago. Uh, two weeks ago last year, so because of COVID, they had to, they had to leave. So it was just a bit of a mess because this is this is when it all comes together. This is when the spirituality that we've been learning, <clears throat> this is when it can really start to, to become part of you to get deep. Uh, this is where all of the community life that we've been learning. This is where we choose. Are we going to engage in it? Or have we learned the system so we know how to dodge stuff? Because that happens. Um, uh, when you're here for a while, you, you, you learn how, how you can get away with stuff without getting caught or how you can kind of have to do a job and someone else will do it, like someone else will pick it up. You know? You've learned, like this, yeah, if I don't turn up to do breakfast preparation, Liam Coyle is going to do it. Like, I mean, I don't have to worry. It'll, it'll get done, so it'll be fine. I don't have to get up and prepare the, the breakfast room because someone else will do it. Like. You know, so the, we, we've learned how the system works and how, how all the different people are, so we know what we can get away with. So is that what we aim for? Do we wait to get caught? Do we wait to get called out on something? Or do we just kind of decide as adults, which is something we always try to treat you as, we don't babysit you, but like we trust you with curfew, we trust you with all sorts of stuff, uh, responsibilities. Uh, are we going to take this final semester now and make the best of it? Or will I allow minimalism and uh, the bit of meh, as I believe millennials call it, or yeah, allow the bit of meh to creep in and say, sure, look, it's just a couple of weeks. Just keep the head down. Do nothing, say nothing, and then we can go home. Like, <laughs> we can do that too, <laughs> if we don't kick you out first. Because um, that attitude really stinks. It's awful. Like, so minimalism, minimalism, minimalism kills. Uh, the, the, the spiritual life. I would dare to say minimalism has done, uh, wreaked probably more havoc in the church in recent decades than communism. Uh, it, because once it gets sent into the church, and, yeah, sure, we'll a bit of liturgy here, and a bit of a mass there, and a bit of prayer here, all this kind of a bit of, no kind of commitment and zeal and urgency. Uh, like minimalism, it just, it destroys the spiritual life. Uh, you might remember we covered, uh, when we were doing our consecration to Our Lady, <clears throat> this one particular uh, meditation from Mother Teresa, this letter that she wrote to her sisters. And it came up in a, in a conversation with someone recently. <clears throat> I just felt this is, it, it's an important kind of approach or an important thing to keep in mind as we head into these, these last 10 weeks of our year together. So Mother Teresa writes, I worry some of you still have not really met Jesus one to one you and Jesus alone we may spend time in chapel 
But have you seen with the eyes of your soul how he looks at you with love? Do you really know the living Jesus? Not from books, but from being with him in your heart. Have you heard the loving words he speaks to you? Ask for the grace. He is longing to give it. Until you can hear Jesus in the silence of your own heart, you will not be able to hear him saying, I thirst in the hearts of the poor. Never give up this daily intimate contact with Jesus as the real living person, not just an idea. How can we last even one day without hearing Jesus say, I love you? Impossible. Our soul needs that as much as the body needs air to breathe. If not, prayer is dead and meditation is only thinking. Jesus wants you each to hear him speaking in the silence of your heart. It's a very simple question. Have you a relationship with Jesus? So after your time here so far, have you a relationship with Jesus? Have you a friendship? Do you know him? Not that we can ever know him so much so that there's no mystery left, but do you even know him as, as, as a friend at, at a minimal level? Because if we don't know him, how on earth can we love him? So this is what we have the chance to do. Not just to know that he exists and to learn a bit of the catechism and be all proud of ourselves so we now know what the Ten Commandments are, but to actually have a relationship with a living God, a friendship, to actually know him. And then that friendship, that relationship with him completely changes what we do and how we do it in the chapel. Like for music ministry, for example, uh, when we're playing or singing, when we're doing so for love of the Lord, you're far less uh, self-conscious. You know, what are they going to think? What am I going to do? Am I going to make a mistake? Or am I, am I too close to the mic? Am I too far from the mic? I don't want the mic at all. What's this mic doing here? You know, all that kind of thing. Just, and you just, just sing. You just sing. Or you're leading prayer. You know, what's everyone going to think? Or the people on the live stream? Or what am I going to, what am I going to do? What am I going to say? Just do it out of love for the Lord. Or when we're doing our house chores and... Uh, the example I often use is the floor cleaner because they're the last one. So when everyone else has gone off skipping into the sunset, picking daisies and throwing petals into the air, you're there in the kitchen, your little Cinderella going on there now, just cleaning the floor while everyone else goes to the ball. You can hear them all in the community room, happy out, enjoying life, and you're looking into a bucket of... <laughs> you know, that's the, those kind of jobs where you're, you're on your own and, and you're the last one, the only one there. Do you do your job well? for love of the Lord. Because Lord, it is enough that you see me. So everything changes when I have a friendship with the Lord, when I know the Lord, when I live for him. So it's just interesting that how, how Mother Teresa phrases it when she's speaking to sisters, right? People who have given their life for the Lord, even more so than, than you have. I worry some of you still have not really met Jesus one to one. This can completely happen in religious life and priesthood as well. Just because we have a collar or a veil doesn't mean that we know the Lord. Uh, we should, but it doesn't, it's not, they're not automatic. This is something we have to decide to do and make room in here for. And there's no rubric or rule that can force me to open my heart. That's my choice. That's me. There's, there's no one else to blame there. It's, it's me. That's my responsibility. So this is what we have the chance to do. Uh, you know the story of, of Sister Claire Crockett. She was born in 82 up in Derry, uh, a very politically tense uh, time in the 80s, in the early 90s as well. And uh, popular girl, good actress, singer, guitarist, uh, talented in many ways, popular with the boys, kind of one of those magnetic personalities who could just do all sorts of impersonations of people and just a funny character. People liked to be around her. And she was invited to a home with the mother retreat and she went along um, somewhat reluctantly but maybe more aiming for the Spanish son and Spanish boys. Uh, so she went out along to this retreat 
and it was a Holy Week retreat, and she sat at the back for most of it and went through her couple of boxes of cheap Spanish cigarettes on a regular basis. And then it, was, it came to be Adoration of the Cross, which we celebrated just a little over two weeks ago, less than a week and a bit ago. And um, she came up, she was told by one of the sisters, so now we go up and we, we kiss the cross. And uh, so she went up, formed, was part of the queue, went up along, and once she kissed the cross, something, something lifted, a veil lifted, something broke inside her, something that needed to be broken. There's all this superf- superficiality and the, 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 the drinking lifestyle, the boys, the career in acting, uh, all these, this money that she'd been promised and so on and so forth, all this kind of thing, it all just started to, to, to break down. She said, what, what's, what's it all about? And she was in the back row of the chapel and the sister came over to her afterwards and could hear her crying. I said, are you okay? She said, the Lord loves me. Why did nobody tell me this? It's an, an astounding thing to say. Like The Lord loves me so much. He did all this for me. Why did nobody tell me? And so this, this beginning of a conversion was, took root in her heart. But she went home and as often happens after the beginnings of a conversion, everything you've ever wanted is given to you. So her acting career started to, to, uh, started to take off and she got uh, various offers also for Nickelodeon in, uh, in the States and had a, uh, a little spot on, on a Channel 4 program. So all was going well and then the, you could almost see the claws and tentacles trying to pull her back down into the world. So she fell again but but something had something had she had seen something it's like she had seen the light now she recognized hang on there is actually is something else i'm still choosing this muck but i I, but at least i've I've seen that there is another life there is another choice this isn't all that's there i had that experience and and, and it remained with her and in a complete turnaround then she decides she speaks to father Raphael on another occasion and apparently with some breed of a bottle, I think it was like, it might have been a bottle of beer and a cigarette. She says to him, "Father, I'm going to be a sister," <laughs> which is how most um, vocation recruiters meet young people these days. Um, so, and uh, lo and behold, she did. But she 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 had a desire for 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 greatness, which it's very interesting how how Father Raphael and the community how they were able to to form her her desire for greatness, which isn't necessarily pride, do you know? I mean, it's normal enough that if you're going to be a doctor, I want to be a good doctor. If I'm going to be a soccer player, I'm going to be the bloody best soccer player I can be. If I'm going to be a musician, I'm going to keep practicing until my fingers bleed, you know, because I want to be good. So why not apply the same thing to priests in religious life? I'm going to be a sister, and I'm going to be a good sister. I'm going to be a priest who prepares, who knows his stuff, and who preaches the truth because he loves the Lord. I mean, it's, it should be completely normal that in our vocations we want to be the best we can be. That's, so the, the, as long as it's for the greater glory of God, you're okay. If it's for the greater glory of your good self, find another job. Um, but she wants to be a good sister. She wants to be a famous sister. And Father Raphael very prudently said to her, so if, you're going to, if you want to be a famous sister, This will come through humility. Be a humble and obedient sister. And it's like she was just able to to almost mechanically assume that and implant it into her into her mind so that her mother superior later would say of her, She was so joyful and so serving. I didn't actually know what she liked and what she didn't like. I guess that's such a compliment, like if someone ever says that of you. I didn't know what she liked to do, what she, didn't like, what she liked to eat and what she didn't like to eat. Because she, she did everything she was asked, she ate everything put in front of her, she did everything with a smile. I couldn't tell you if she actually liked broccoli or not because she always ate it, I, I don't know. Just, just a person who's just so joyful and selfless. In her various missions then, she was fantastic, especially with kids. And her, um, not so much her motto, but like her, her life, uh, goal as given to her by Father Raffaele was uh, alone with Christ alone. 
So you're such, such a magnetic person, you know, who loves laughing and acting and, and, and lifting people up. And yet your, your goal is alone with Christ alone. So it's like, it's your interior life. All that mission, that's, that's good, it's important. That's all out there. Your first mission is in here. Your first mission is with the Lord. Get that right, everything else will fall into place. Alone with Christ alone. And then she, so she was able to, to, to then living as such with Christ alone, living for him, the way she lived on the outside was like all or nothing. All or nothing. I'm going to be a good sister or I'm, or I'm leaving, you know. So all or nothing. And so in her missions, uh, if you've ever seen the, the, the video of her life, uh, there were occasions where she actually had a split in migraine. Uh, and in the missions, especially with kids, it can be loud and... I've never actually had a migraine, so I've no idea what it's like, but it's apparently not nice. I can imagine a thumping head. I've had a couple of toothaches in my time. I can imagine it's kind of like that just up here. I don't know. But to have an actual migraine and you've got kids screaming and they say, sister, 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 can we sing this song or play this game? And you're like, yeah, sure. And then you're like, just say, salve Maria. And the whole chapel is roaring at you and your head is just bursting. But you're doing it for the greater glory of God. You know, so selfless. They didn't even, couldn't even then... On one or two occasions, she actually had to kind of, excuse me a second, and she'd head off, and she'd actually vomit with the pain of, uh, of, of her migraine and come back in and play with the kids. I mean, just incredible, bless this, incredible selflessness. As her mother superior said, I didn't know what she, act- what she actually liked to do and what she didn't, because she did everything with such love and with a smile. So, back to us. We have 10 weeks here. What are you going to do? Because no matter what I say up here, or no matter what we read or what we study, ultimately, the primary responsible for your formation is you. No one else can open the doors of your heart. No one else can decide to make this happen, to make this formation real, to make this formation formation for life, as opposed to putting down 10 weeks in a mansion. We have a chance here, and like a lot of chances, they do pass. The period where we can do a certain thing will pass us by. You know, life doesn't always afford us the, the, the opportunity to, re, to retry various things. And once this year is over, it's, it's over. That's it. Might be, may, maybe a possibility for a second year, maybe, maybe not. So, you've 10 weeks, but you've 10 weeks in a place where you've been chosen to be by the almighty creator of the universe who placed all the bits and pieces in place, my mother included, to get people here and to guide them closer to his own heart. He has chosen you. You are the chosen. So what are you going to do? Let us not say at the end of, of, of these 10 weeks, I should have given more. I should have tried harder. I should have prayed more. I should have prayed better or deeper. I should have developed a relationship with, with this person or that person who I don't know so well. I discovered at the end of the year, actually, I don't know anything about them. I should have been more united with my brother. I should have been more united with my sisters. I should have been quicker to forgive. I should have gone to confession more. Should have prayed more in the silence. Should have read more. Whatever those should have, you think you're going to have at the end of the year, fix them now. You've got 10 weeks, and it's going to be an opportunity that you may not have again. This is a gift. This is an opportunity. And so we ask the good Lord to strengthen us every day, in every decision, that we will make the best of our time here. And that we, like Sister Claire Crockett, might live not just our our time here, but our lives in general for the Lord with this attitude of all or nothing. Amen.